Welcome. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sister Annie Killian, the Public Humanities Fellow at the Medieval Institute at Notre Dame. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our conversation today on sacred art and the journey toward justice with artist and iconographer Kelly Lattimore. This is the third webinar in our Pilgrimage for Healing and Liberation series, which I'll mention again at the end of the hour. We wanna get started right away. So for today's format, I will introduce our moderator, Dr. Richard Klee, who will then introduce artist Kelly Lattimore. The two of them will have a discussion for about 40 minutes and then take questions from the audience. So we welcome your questions and I invite you to type whatever you'd like to ask into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, type in a question at any point and Dr. Klee will field those later in the hour. So without further ado, let me introduce our moderator. Dr. Richard Klee is an affiliate faculty member of the Notre Dame Initiative on Race and Resilience. Professor Klee is a scholar of the internationalization of Judaism and Christianity. His first monograph entitled Religion in Migration, Early Judaism and Tobit, explores the earliest complete manuscript of the Book of Tobit and its refashioning of ethnic, literary, and ritual traditions for displaced and diasporic communities. A faculty member with the Moreau College Initiative at Westville Correctional Facility for seven years, Dr. Klee co-developed its Required Humanities Core Curriculum. Formerly director of an ESL School for Adult Immigrants, Dr. Klee currently serves on the boards of Education Bridge of South Sudan and the Shirley Heinz Land Trust. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Klee. Thank you very much, Sister Annie, and uh, thank you for organizing this uh, webinar and also, also the, the series on pilgrimage, uh, sacred art liberation. Um, I'm uh, delighted, <clears throat> very glad to welcome uh, iconographer Kelly Lattimore uh, with us today. Uh, Kelly Lattimore <clears throat> is an artist and an iconographer from St. Louis, Missouri. He started painting icons in 2010 while a member of the Common Friars a small monastic farming community in Athens, Ohio. Uh, Lattimore's icons often portray <clears throat> with classic orthodox iconog iconographic imagery, figures representing the marginalized and the oppressed among us here and now. Lattimore's icon refugees, La Sagrada Familia, in which the flight to Egypt is interpreted as Hispanic immigrants crossing the border, adorns the cover of Pope Francis' book, A Stranger and You Welcomed Me. Lattimore has also created a diverse array of icons of unexpected saints, such as poet Mary Oliver, Congressman John Lewis, and Mr. Rogers. Welcome, Kelly. Yeah, thank you for having me today. Thank you for everyone joining us. So as, as Sister Annie said, we have, we have a lot of opportunity for uh, dialogue here with you. And I'd like to start with a, a fairly basic question. Um, in thinking of, of sacred art, <clears throat> Kelly, as a, as a pilgrim's journey, uh, how did you begin? Mm. Well, um, again, thank you for having me. <clears throat> I uh, grew up in the Chicagoland area. I'm a PK, as they say, a pastor's kid. And my father is still a... a uh, a preacher in a small Protestant denomination. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up there, you know, sitting in the bulletin, I was drawing pictures all over the hymnals and things, which I shouldn't have done. But um, really, at that time, I, I really grew up with a, my father and I talk about this a lot of spirituality that was really about, unfortunately, transcendence in a way that it was almost like Jesus and I versus the world. And it was a uh, looking back on it now very, uh, uh, damaging way to look at the world and be in it. And um, as I moved on and in adulthood, I ended up uh, going to Greenville University where I studied religion and art. 
um, there, which ended up working out perfectly. <laughs> but um, during that time uh, and after school and the mentorship there was very formative and not only learning how to be a better artist, but also looking at the world and trying to find God in uh, the very uh, in plain sight. And it was during that time and trying to find new ways of, 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 of living that I met a, a couple named Paul and Sarah who started a, a small monastic farming community. Um, and, but the main part of mission was, was a farm called the Good Earth Farm where we grew food for food pantries. Um, and doing that work um, and had we had volunteers that would come and people who whether the homeless poor that lived in the area would come and we were all growing food for our community and the work of putting your hands on the soil and the conversations that came from weeding a bed of carrots and all of these things and then sharing meals at the meal table and and having a Eucharist service uh, there on the farm every Thursday and and just the whole experience really kind of took my spirituality from transcendence to communion, engagement, and embodiment, that the way that we use things is of the utmost spiritual significance. Um, and so for me as an artist, um, do, had to, been doing landscape and uh, landscape and, and portrait work and other work, it was really through this community experience that uh, really uh, brought art to that the artist is in the work of the art, not only of an artist, but also what it means to be human is about learning how to be more present. And, um, and this is during this time where I, I found iconography and we can talk more about that. But. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, let's um, explore the, the first moments where you um, developed as an iconographer and, and decided on this uh, journey as an artist. Sure. Um, you, you shared elsewhere that um, some of your first steps involved uh, tracing the lines uh, of others' work, mm. and uh, you did this for months. So, so why why did you do this, and uh, what did you learn about sacred art from this uh, painstaking practice of, of traveling the lines uh, drawn by others? Yeah. So, one of the members of this community, the Common Friars, was uh, Father Tom, who's a priest, and. It literally happened that uh, I had no, always known what icons were. Um, growing up in Chicago, my friends and I used to walk uh, Lake Michigan and get really cold and always go into the uh, the chapel on Loyola's campus and seeing the saints in the, in the, in the, <laughs> the back room while warming up. Um, you know, they'd always been fresh in my mind. But Father Tom, one day as I was painting and he said, had you ever tried iconography? And I hadn't. And so I immediately just was curious and poured over texts and books and just found as much uh, artwork and, and the old, old icons and uh, just this wealth of, uh, of things that we had where I lived in Ohio, Ohio University was in the town that we lived and going to the library and coming back. And I just started doing what all artists do, but iconographers specifically, they just started tracing over the old lines and really a pilgrimage of just re-understanding that this was a, a common practice within iconographer that young iconographers would come and they'd trace over the, the, the master artists, you know, lines, but that the lines weren't an end of themselves, but you're really training yourself and putting yourself in a habit that when the lines aren't there, you're able to continue and do it. And so really uh, doing that for months, I was really formative and, you know, learning how to, to be a, a better artist and an iconographer and learning these things. And then as, but as, as I was doing this and I was, you know, still farming and, and my, one of my best friends and fellow farmer and brother, Paul, he often used to say, as we're, you know, working the land and, and caring for our neighbors, how do we be people in Jesus words that can continue to consider the lilies of the field. Mm -hmm. And that image struck me. And I, that, became the focus of my first original icon and if you see it it's it's not it's not a great icon it was a good first try um jesus is my lines are shaky and jesus is almost surprised that the lilies are in his hands the way that i did it um but what is important is that the community embraced it because it was a part of our common experience and i think that that first entrance into trying to create original icon really showed me 
how art can be a placeholder for communities thought prayer but most importantly their their action mm -hmm. uh, and i think that that was a very informative uh first try that the community you know decided to embrace image even though it was um you know not the greatest um icon but mm -hmm. i i still love that image because of of that experience mm -hmm. Oh, could I ask a follow-up to that question? You have one icon uh, dedicated to um, uh, Cimabue, the tradition of this great medieval Italian artist. Yes. Um, uh, what, what about Cimabue, uh, the lines of this uh, iconographer, uh, mm -hmm. did, did, you, did you find most uh, helpful? Or, or why, why did you cite um, this particular artist in your work? Yes. Well, unfortunately, I think much, much of the, in Assisi there, the mother uh, church, um, of the Franciscan order in Assisi during the earthquake, I think it was 1990 or 2000. I don't remember exactly when it was, 90s or 2000s. Uh, many of the the images by uh, Giotto and Cimabue uh, were damaged and destroyed. And and um, through some of my relationships with the Franciscans, um, really close relationships, we had talked a lot about these images, and they were so faded and and damaged and but so beautiful in some of the the archival photos of the way they looked and again it's it's a it's i think as a as all artists but people like as you get older i just i'm about to turn 37 tomorrow actually as it's learning about how to continually stay inspired and uh look at the world and my franciscan brothers just you know they just pointed me and got me curious and so i just started looking at some of these um, old images there. And I loved his, his beautiful, it's the, uh, the uh, with Mary and, and Christ. And it's so different from many images of his time because Jesus and, and Christ are, or Jesus and Mary are, are, they're hugging in a very tender and loving way. And you can tell by the pattern that the, the image was just gorgeous. And so, I just traced over the lines and made a few. Uh, I had Christ more so gazing at the viewer, changed a few things. Um, but I just love that idea of, you know, mother, mo uh, his a son hugging his mother and the colors there and what they might have looked like, you know. Um, and so just working on that piece was really beautiful. And again, connecting a pilgrimage of its own, of connecting to, to artists in the past who have. I like to call done the work of holy pondering about Christ and his relationships and God, who God is, who our neighbors are. And so I get to kind of enter in that with the living, but then also the dead in a way. So. And on this um, Franciscan path, um, I, I know you have a lot of roots in the Franciscan tradition and uh, you, you've created delightful icons of uh, St. Francis Troubadour and St. Francis with the novices. Um, uh, Bonaventure uh, wrote his uh, Journey of the Mind of God while, while contemplating Francis of Assisi's pierced body, uh, the place where he received uh, his wounds. And uh, he, he writes that this poor man was like Jacob's ladder to him, um, a place where uh, he could go up to heaven and where he could see those um, coming down to earth. Uh, what, what medieval perspectives on the body do you find most um, inspiring or helpful uh, in your work? Mm. I think with, with Francis, um, <clears throat> the thing, and then what's so beautiful about that you really uh, understand with with images that you know the frescoes that Giotto did in that same very same church as the the uh, Christ and then his mother is this idea that that Francis was going to the margins, and that he was very much entering into the suffering with the poor and oppressed and those in the margins, the leper. Um, in a very real, tangible way, him being so so di disgusted at the leper at first, but then when when he came to a place where he was willing to embrace the leper, just that journey of going out and being in the fields and being with uh, you know nature, it just I think it's very it connects as human beings, especially the, at that time. I'm sure it, people were very drawn to 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 him. That it was the the gospel and, and Christ and God was taken out of the, the walls of the church and, and 
Francis was pointing towards the, these things that were right in plain sight. And I, so, so I think, you know, making the invisible visible. And I, so I think for me, and so much about the Franciscan spirituality is that idea. Um, and it really, the life of Francis, but also this a thought of making the, the invisible visible um, is work that I hope to continually do with the iconography and displaying um, images of, of people who are, are in the mon margins here and now. And that could be in plain sight that if you're, you know, looking for Jesus in your neighbor, in your neighborhood, go walk around and you'll probably find him. <laughs> and Francis very much believed that. And, um, and in the ways that he also, you know, as a musician and, and poet, but then also as he was, you know, stories of him picking up worms and putting them in his cloak to, you know, just so interested by them to the, you know, the very people that he, he loved where it hurts. And so how do you, how do you display that in, in a, in a painting in a way that is, takes that symbol and the beauty of that idea and kind of merges it into one. And it's been an, and Francis's life has been an endless uh, supply of just beautiful contemplation about how to kind of take that symbol and meaning and, and put it into uh, one image. Well, um, thinking about his uh, life, his community life with the lepers um, and with the marginalized, uh, wh whose bodies uh, do you contemplate in these days? Um, wh whose wounds, especially the marginalized, are, are you thinking about as you as you create and you practice your art? Mm. Well, for us, I'm you know I find myself in in a place, St. Louis. But I'm very much uh, influenced by an artist when I was in uh, Ohio named Harlan Hubbard, and <laughs> this is kind of unorthodox for a Zoom webinar. Harlan Hubbard, I'll show you an image. Harlan Hubbard was an artist. He lived right across the river in Kentucky uh, from where I lived in Ohio. And he, he um, was a landscape artist in a, a church there in Kentucky had asked him to, to paint a picture of the Jordan River above their baptismal. Uh, but Harlan punked them. And instead of painting their, the Jordan River, he decided to paint their own Ohio River. Uh -huh. That's his image. And I think that's what's so interesting about that is that Harlan was really saying, you know, if you're looking for a holy river, the Ohio River is your holy river. But the the holy land is sacred because it's part of all the world. <laughs> and I think that's the what I hope to to do is that if again, if like Francis, if I'm looking for Jesus, I should go walk around my neighborhood and, and I'll find him. And so for me. And my, my partner and I, these are the images that we gravi gravitate towards and collaborate on together. And uh, just this past, one of my recent icons is called uh, Tent City Nativity. It's an image of the Holy Family in it, um, which is sadly throughout the nation. There's now, and since COVID, there's these communities that have gathered of people who just are not able to, to afford. Um, yeah, there it is. Thank you. Uh, afford to live in housing and rent and, and supplies. And so they've gathered And St. Louis is a, uh, one of these cities in America that has a, a very uh, large, had a large population, a, a big tent city within it. Um, and people are really struggling. And then St. Louis had just put in a camping ban in effect starting January 23, 2023, which made it illegal to camp on any public land. Those are people that are really suffering literally in, in my backyard. And I think that those are the, the, the people that I, taking the tradition of, of iconography, but carrying it into the present in such a way where we can learn how to see and, and see Christ um, right among us. And so for me, you know, having, you know, symbolisms of the, the star, the star, the people kind of having the gifts that they have instead of frankincense and myrrh, it's coffee and a blanket and, and, you know, some soup. But I think that taking these, again, the same metaphors that the, the experience of uh, Mary and Joseph and uh, baby Jesus 2000 years ago, that is still happening to, to the homeless poor, to the refugee who, you know, is fleeing violence in, in their land and is fleeing and, and, and coming um, from various ways. 
And so I, I think it's these are the kind of images that uh, I hope to create as kind of real again, taking the tradition and, and the forms of iconography, but carrying it into the present so it's made new and um, and can potentially do what all art can potentially do, which is create dialogue and um, can be used as a new way to to see and help each other to see. Well, Kelly, you, you said uh, coffee in a blanket. So let's uh, turn to another repeated subject in your art, uh, Dorothy sure. Day. Yes. Uh, the, the Benedictine laywoman um, who uh, lived much of her life in New York City, uh, co-founding the Catholic Worker and uh, Houses of Hospitality um, around the country uh, for immigrants and the urban poor. Um, as, a, as a journalist and a writer, uh, she wrote a column for decades that was entitled On Pilgrimage. And her newspapers, uh, which were sold for just a single cent, uh, often featured sacred art. Um, how, how has Day's journey uh, influenced and, and accompanied uh, yours? Mm. Well, Dorothy Day has had a profound inf influence on me, um, and uh, specifically and my partner, Evie, very much so. She worked at the Catholic Worker House in Denver for many years, um, and so she really commissioned this piece and a newer piece that we did as well. And this piece is actually the board that it's on, I, I took from a dumpster. And so to to take something that was discarded and, and use it for the image felt very Dorothy Day. And I think what's so interesting about her and connecting it back to Francis is, you know, Francis was really suffering and, and down in the trench, little dirt and mud with with the lepers and the poor. And I think what Dorothy Day, she did it, but in a very different way. And I love her quote where she said, you know, don't call me a saint because I don't want to be dismissed so easily. And, and I think what she means by that and what she is really calling us to is that this is work that everybody can do, anybody can do. And I, and I really love that part of her journey. And not only as a woman and fighting against, you know, uh, nonviolence and all of the work that she did, um, she was really trying to show that this is, this is something that we can all do and that the seeds of genuine love and of God's love are enacted in the most ordinary acts uh, every day of giving um, someone soup or uh, someone who's on the street giving them a warm bed to sleep in. Um, and again, that the, the Holy Family is among us here now. This is uh, Dorothy Day and the Holy Family of the Streets. That uh, through her life and her example, she is showing that that the work of, of caring for your neighbor and, and the love there is can be done in, in a communal way, in a way where there's a uh, a mutual moving towards wholeness and I and I think her her journey into creating the not only the Catholic Worker newspaper and the work that it did um, but also the work of the Catholic Worker House movement and and that as the government was uh, not doing a great job in her time of taking care of the poor she just put it upon herself to create these houses of, of welcome and hospitality um, and so, you know, what a, what a woman. And, you know, she said, don't call me a saint. And she's now in the process of being canonized, which is really interesting. But I think it's it just in people who've known her, like Robert Ellsberg, uh, felt really uh, spoke really eloquently on, on why they think she should be she should be canonized. But I think she's someone who can cont continually, again, is moving us towards looking at looking at and learning how to see. Um, the brokenness and the suffering among us and that caring for the poor, the orphan, the widow, the refugee, the immigrant is something is work that we can all do. And um, I think that's just absolutely beautiful the way that she lived her life. And, and, and it was a pure example of that. And this icon we have on, on the screen uh, presents a, a, a theme that that's present in a number of your works, uh, which is, which is that you have, the figures of Jesus and Mary and Joseph, uh, literally in the midst of experiencing the conditions of Matthew 25. So as hungry, uh, begging on the street without shelter, um, as a refugee family uh, without shelter, um, as, as subject to arrest uh, or imprisonment, uh, as, as with your icon, icon of, of George Floyd and his mother. Um, so in, in Matthew 25, uh, uh, Jesus presents a, a dilemma, I think, um, so hearing hearing from both those who hurt, uh, serve the hungry, uh, the homeless and the sick, the imprisoned, and also hearing from those who do not, um, 
they each say the same thing, that they did not see Jesus in these people. Uh, so as a sacred artist, um, how, how do you address this, this dilemma? Uh, how, how, how can you make art, uh, visible uh, that which seems unseen uh, mm -hmm. in our common experience? And uh, how do you sensitize your audience to the suffering that, that isn't being seen? It's a great question. Um, really, I mean, just go through the term again. So icon, the word icon, for those who may not know, is literally just Greek for image. Icon or iconography, you know, written image. Um, it's something, it's a window to God pointing us um, towards a, a person or, you know, Christ or a saint who's, who led a life, you know, fighting against injustice, lived life of love and compassion and peace. Um, but what's interesting about iconography is that, and this is someone else's canned goods, Father Mark Bazzuti Jones, but he likes to say that the icons can also be iconoclastic as an iconoclasticism or breaking images in the sense that there is something about the image of God that will always be resisted. That there's something about the image of God that will always be crucified because we continue to crucify each other. And what this icon did, you know, after the tragic death of George Floyd, my, uh, my partner and I, we were just absolutely uh, torn apart by and as so many others, it's terrible death. And we're talking with our community. Uh, we, we began to talk about what, what kind of image could we do to really not only mourn the death of, of George Floyd, but could move us towards something that, so this just doesn't keep happening. That, that uh, mothers, uh, mothers are continually losing their, their daughters and their sons unjustly, who are unjustly murdered by the state, just as Mary did 2,000 years ago. And so for us, the pieta became clear. And, and originally in the, in the image, Mary was looking down at the, the Christ figure. Um, but then we, we shifted her gaze as almost to say, you know, what are we going to do? Again, what are we going to do so this doesn't keep happening? And we changed that. We, you know, showed a lot of our friends and others. And they said, yes, that's exactly how it needs to be. And this, I, But again, this icon received a lot of pushback. And I think it is, uh, again, we it's as we struggle with the image of God, we're struggling with something that's also within ourselves. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately at Catholic University of America, this icon where there's prints of it and it was stolen twice and removed from the walls. Um, and I think there's a few things going on there, but for, for me, and it's a very sad, but for me, it's this uh, understanding that, that, Again, what art can potentially do is uh, help us learn how to see and to see another example, another icon that I did, I don't think is on there, but when I first started doing iconography, I did an icon, the very traditional Christ the Pantocrator, it's Christ the teacher. He's holding the sacred text, the gospels, and he's making you know a, a sign for peace or Christ. And um, I, I was painting it and this is very ridiculous, but I ended up calling baby hands Jesus because I was a young artist and I just could not get the hands right. I got very frustrated with it and I set it up on a shelf. A few years went by and I had some new gold leaf and I wanted to try it out. And so I got the icon down and I, I gold leafed over it. But when I was done, I, I looked at it and there's kind of a gold leaf thing. I looked at it and I saw that it looked like a gold leaf floor, but board but when I got up close I could see the raised face of Christ and I was like oh this is something and uh two fr friends of mine who are priests they came into my studio and they saw it and they immediately said oh my gosh that's the cloud of unknowing yeah. and um for people who don't know cloud of unknowing was written by a 14th century unknown author but but basically it's it's really about that um, we can only get so far in knowing God but the more that we put God under a cloud of unknowing or a cloud forgetting, the more that we'll know him through the heart. Um, but what is beautiful about that and, and why I tell that story is that they saw it. They named what it was. And therefore, it had become a new gift. And, and for me, I think the sacred art 
in our time that's really going to make an impact. And I'm not the only one doing it. There's so many other beautiful artists doing this. Is, is really going to do that. It's going to help us name the racism that's within ourselves, name the, way, name, name the ways that we are not loving our neighbor well or treating ourselves well, or the ways that we are not you know, clothing the, the poor and feeding the hungry. And so I, I'm really, I think that really gets down, this image really did that is there was so much pushback, but it, it really, I think was important because it showed that potentially the art in our churches can be can be something that creates dialogue. It, it, and that brings up the question, what is church art for? Is it glorified wallpaper or can it be someone that actually connects us and connects each other and how we then go out in the world and see Christ you know, uh, on the streets or what have you? And so um, I think as, as, uh, as I continue to create this, this is the kind of artwork that I would like to continue to create as I, as I move forward as an artist and iconographer, because I think it, it, I could see that these are the conversations that we often run away from, like Peter around the fire. You know, are we gonna, going to, to stand with Christ in his suffering, his crucified Christ? Or, you know, are we going to have the hard conversations? Are we going to run away and act like they don't exist? And so I hope that, the, and not only artwork, but, you know, what visual art, what poetry, what music, what all of these things that we can bring into our communities to create these conversations that really, really needs these hard conversations oftentimes that really need to happen. And so I hope that that's the, the work that I can continually do. And, and Mama and these other pieces are, um, I feel like, good examples of that. Mm -hmm. and, and this will be my, my last question before we uh, move to the uh, Q&A with the audience. Uh, again, as, as Sister Annie's invited everyone uh, participating, you're, you're welcome to submit questions uh, through the Q&A, and then uh, we'll, we'll present them to Kelly uh, in a little bit. Um, all right, thinking uh, more locally to, to Notre Dame, <clears throat> um, I, I grew up in a neighborhood near Notre Dame on the west side, and um, it's uh, a place that's about a mile from campus. And uh, recently it was, it was found to have uh, higher levels of, of childhood lead poisoning uh, than Flint, Michigan. Mm. Um, these are predominantly African-American and Hispanic children um, who, again, are very close to Notre Dame. And uh, at the school where I grew up, uh, which is now about a third African-American, a third Hispanic, and a third uh, Caucasian students, uh, when we did an inventory of sacred art on our campus in the parish and the school, uh, we found that about 2% had persons of color portrayed. So uh, thinking about your, your perspective on art, sacred art as, as um, inviting dialogue, as, as enhancing visibility, especially those on the margins, mm -hmm. uh, what, 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 what is your suggestion, your, your recommendation to um, uh, people who belong to uh, churches, uh, communities of faith, about how they consider uh, art in their um, in their uh, on their campuses and in their in their churches. Hmm. Yes, um, I think one of my favorite parts parts about iconography is that it is a, a very communal art that I get to kind of enter in these dialogues with different uh, communities and what they're thinking about. And I can't tell you the just how many parishes and communities are at this moment really reflecting on representation. Um, of, in their churches and in their artwork. There's an older black woman here in St. Louis um, who she grew up in a predominantly uh, white congregation. And up until, from a really young age, up until her 20s, mid 20s, she thought that black individuals could not go to, to heaven because all of the artwork that she saw was the angels were white and the saints were white. And I think that really gets at what you're saying is that representation really does matter. And this is a huge conversation going on in the church. And I think um, some of the history of iconography could maybe point us to a way forward. And, you know, for the, this isn't exactly the, the exact date, but for almost the first thousand years, the early church was really the ones that was choosing the saints, the people that, you know, a, an old woman who cared for the poor right among them and they wanted to remember her life and the way that she was and um and people that they actually knew 
until you know the, the papacy and, and the Vatican that took took it over and it began to be something it's not you know your neighbor it's someone that lived far away yes they lived beautiful lives but it began the communities weren't choosing local communities choosing you know who these people were and I think that's interesting because and what, what I see from from congregations and the conversations that they're, they're having specifically about representation is really bringing the, the the people that they knew and loved into into uh, artwork, maybe not having a halo, maybe not having uh, you know these uh, very traditional and uh, uh, iconographic images, but really having conversations about you know the people that have meant something to them and ways that they can honor them through the art. Um, I think that's one one major conversation that's happening. But also, I think what happened in America is what's been really sad is we've locked Jesus into one image, a white, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed man. And a lot of that, you know, we could talk about Warner Solomon's The Head of Christ, which was, you know, back in the 1920s. Most of you see it, Jesus is like kind of in to the side, almost like a 70s yearbook photo. And we had it in the church I grew up with. And that was passed out to every world war ii soldier you know as they like went overseas it was they had a, a card of that and so we've locked jesus into one image but i think what that says is if jesus is white and then god is white then potentially authority is white and how do people of color see that then <laughs> how they see themselves in christ and then therefore how do, do people who are white then see people of color so this is this is just a even uh, looking th towards new representations of Christ as, as black and, and a brown man, I think is very interesting and beautiful. And they are hard conversations, but I think the way forward is, is really um, is having those hard conversations again. And there's parishes that are willing to do it and are doing that work now and, and commissioning beautiful, all kinds of beautiful artwork not for just for me, but stained glass work and, and, and uh, you know, commissioning uh, different tapestries and all of this. And so it's a very important conversation and it's very, it's been very hard in, in witnessing some of these conversations, but we have to have them if we're going to, to continue to really be the, the church that is welcoming the stranger and welcoming um, everyone that's in it, that they feel represented, represented, represented. And that, um, you know, the all embracing love of God uh, does not, uh, does not, um, you know, let anyone, uh, everyone's, everyone's welcome. And that to deny uh, the, the image of God in anyone is a complete denial of the incarnation. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Kelly. Um, we, we do have some questions, uh, which uh, we'll, we'll turn to from uh, the participants in this webinar. Uh, so, so I'll just read them, and, and again, uh, everyone here is welcome to, to submit questions for Kelly uh, in the Q&A. <clears throat> so uh, here's a question from Noreen Martin. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you try to make the invisible visible. How do you plan on continuing making the invisible visible through your art? Hmm. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think that again um why again why like iconography it's a very communal art i think of the the next again it's, it's learning how to see and there's so many communities who are again as you shared uh richard uh you know are experiencing some you know really hard things within their community and and impoverishment, you know, injustice with uh, the environment, everything. And I think for me, I'm really, have done a lot of work that's been between my partner and I and my community in St. Louis, but I'm really interested in to having more conversations with communities and the ways that they're trying to see God in plain sight. Um, and to con con continue to, to do that and have these conversations um, and so that's my hope moving forward is that I continue to, you know, look in my own backyard for where I'm seeing Christ and God and, and the poor and oppressed, but also really moving um, and doing whatever I can to 
to have these kind of holy pondering and, and dialogue with other people across the country and then world or wherever that may take us. But that's my hope is to, to be a conduit to helping continue to foster these, these types of uh, conversations and dialogue within the church. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, George Christopher um, on Jesus hugs his mother is the hand over Mary's right shoulder, Jesus's left hand, Mary's right hand, or a fusion of the two as an abstract depiction of their fusion, their love? It's a great question. I was very actually confused when I first saw this image, the original, that Mary is almost has her, her almost her whole arm resting on, on Christ's shoulder. Um, but, you know, and Christ has his arm fully around Mary. But I love that you saw it that way. That's this fusion. And I think that's, again, as these images, as we all, as the viewer looks at, looks at it, we all bring our own context and our own sight. And I think that's beautiful. And it's just another way that I think that art doesn't have to be a stagnant thing. It's, we're, we are constantly inundated with images, as you know, through social media, advertisements, all of these things. Like we're just inundated with it. But I think what art can potentially do, and not just my work, but it can really teach us when we're so quick to speak into things, but it can really teach us how to observe. I think that's really important and to then enter into that together, I think is a really beautiful work and things like Lecto uh, or Visio Divina and these other practices that we have to really look and see together. So I love that you saw that, that fusion. I think that's beautiful. And uh, Kelly, we have a request. Um, could you talk about making your icon Christ Breaks the Rifle? Yes. Um, Christ Break Breaks the Rifle, um, as so many, I'm very, very tired of the gun legislation in, in our country and that guns continually are more protected and we some individuals are more concerned about protecting their guns than protecting children um and so for us after the uvalde shooting specifically i had been contemplating this work by otto pan pan panock who was from uh which was done in the 30s and he was a german printmaker and artist and his original painting is in the same pose but with a, more of a wooden rifle. But uh, he, he lived in Germany, but was named as a degenerate artist by Hitler. And he was famously uh, one of the many who were, were uh, had their artwork in the degenerate artists uh, exhibition that, that the Nazis put on. And so you can see why Hitler hated him uh, so much. But I, I, I wanted to go, I, I, back to this work and take that print and, and it's really inspired by Otto and this original image and, and again carry that towards the present and having Christ you know yeah it's a metal gun it's an AR-15 but I'm sure Christ could break that over his knee if he wanted to he's Jesus but having that really bring a kind of a more of a modern context to that same really powerful powerful image that Otto it's a print it's a woodblock print that he did and so really just tra again, tracing that, that, that main line and the lines of the, the aura or the halo coming off of Christ and the basic prints, but then bringing that color and um, icon iconography, the iconographic, excuse me, style uh, to the print. And um, we, we use this image to help raise some funds for several organizations uh, working towards uh, uh, Moms Demand Gun uh, Gun Reform and a few other uh, organizations that uh, were local around here as well. Um, but again, just trying to, it's created a lot of interesting dialogue um, as well. That, uh, you know, guns mean uh, different things to different people and those conversations still need to happen. Thank you. And we do have a request uh, for, for some references or, or links to some of the artists that, that are being discussed here, like, like Otto. So um, maybe we can try to provide that. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Oh, uh, another question is, um, where, where can we find uh, more of your work? Where is it being displayed? Um, where, where can one see it? If one wants to learn more about uh, what your, your, your body of work. Mm. There, uh, my, the, our website, just kellylattimoreicons.com is where my work is. Um, there's several uh, actual icons um, across the country that you can see. There's one here in St. Louis, the original of Mama is here at a parish named Holy Communion. Um, I recently did a devotional portrait of Matthew Shepard for the National Cathedral in Washington, DC, um, which can be um, at view at times in their columbarium. Um, and several, uh, being in Ohio for a long, thank you, this is the portrait of Matthew Shepard, which used uh, letters that the Matthew's parents, Dennis and Judy had received over the years after Matt's uh, tragic murder, um, that that's the the halo that's kind of creating um, his halo, the the aura for him, and that's in uh, Washington D.C. And then I lived in Ohio for a long time, so there's several churches across Ohio in Athens, Ohio, that have several um, images that uh, that are on display and um, part of the worshiping body there uh, used regularly. So. Thank you. Uh, another question from Claire Bartz. Uh, what, what is your favorite piece that you have created and what inspired its creation? Mm. I think the, the piece that I was very much a Luddite for a while doing this work and it was kind of, I was doing a few icons and some, some folks in the parish I was at had requested a few commissions and um, so it really snowballed uh, from there. Um, but when the first, when I first got social media, and after the 2016 ele election, when there was a lot of rhetoric around anti-stranger and anti-immigrant, um, we right around this time, my my partner Evie and I met a young man around a bonfire who was from Guatemala, and he was undocumented. But hearing his his pain, his fears, um, how he had gotten to America or across the desert and, and what he had seen and his hopes and his dreams just shook us to our core. And we, again, uh, thought of um, thought of him and with all this rhetoric going on, and we thought of that his he was a refugee and his experience uh, was still happening or that it was had happened to Mary, Joseph and Jesus being refugees, fleeing Herod and and, uh, and that is still happening today and in his story. And so that became the basis of La Sacreda Familia, which um, is the uh, a version of, of Joseph, Mary, and, and Jesus, you know, uh, fleeing and, and in the desert at night. And that young man uh, in his story just, just really shook us. And I think that icon is important because it's... This is to me is it's an icon, but it's also an icon to the sense of the, this young man who is so vil vil vilified in our country and is he's a beautiful person and he has the image of God within him. And it's an icon uh, for my partner, Evie and I, of, of that and of that, that man, that young man that we met around the bonfire. And so that means a lot to us, this image. And that um, hopefully will continue to, again, it, it got a lot of pushback when I, it was the first image I put online and it got a lot of pushback, but I think it, it has also created a lot of dialogue in our country about um, immigration and the stranger that the church itself is made up of strangers. And like, how do we, you know, see our neighbors and, and those um, undocumented individuals who are coming here and how do we, uh, as the church, take care? Um, again, this is an actual family I met in Palestine. This is called Refugees, the Holy Family. And this is a family that I met there that they were in a refugee camp and mother was sensing something wrong uh, with her pregnancy. That something wasn't right. And so they cut a hole in the fence and walked through the desert and got to a hospital right around dawn. And she gave birth, ended up being okay and giving birth to a beautiful baby girl. But again, it's just, the, the plight of the refugees across this world have really were the same thing that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph went through. And again, I, I just, I hope to continually highlight stories like this and through the work that um, 
they almost they become a, a metaphor and it's a symbol that really points us towards God and Christ and and seeing them in, in our neighbors and, and our neighbors across the world as well. So I hope to continue to make more work like this. And uh, Kelly, we have a question from Emma Feller. She asks, with all the difficult topics that you take the time to paint, uh, does the hope for the future drive your passion? <laughs> or where do you find happiness in these recurring themes of, of tragedy uh, in our modern world? Mm. It's a great question. Um, it, I, know, I know for me that, that especially, I'm about to turn 37 again tomorrow, and but think just reflecting back and on my youth, I think oftentimes you, you kind of hear this like save the world syndrome that a lot of young people have, which I think is kind of a it's not a great phrase, but I think for me that everything can just seem so macro, these like huge problems that they're just everywhere. And I got to go back to my experience as a farmer and just sticking my hands in the soil and the work of weeding a bed of carrots and then sharing those carrots in, in a soup for the homeless poor at a table and sitting next to someone that yeah. these things that can be the ways that we're taking care of our neighbor and ourselves don't have to be these macro solutions and things that they can be very micro and that the work that we can do, we can do um, you know, again, right in our own backyard. And I think that I'm an artist and I'm not, I don't know how to solve all of these problems, but I feel like I've been given a gift to try to, to, to continually stay, stay inspired, but also point towards the ways that I see my, my partner, Evie, see God and Christ right in front of us. And Yes, uh, showing pointing towards beauty, but also pointing towards the ways that that despite uh, the pain among us and, and despite all the suffering, that there is still goodness and beauty and uh, you know people uh, fighting against injustice and 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 doing this work right in front of us. And I just want to you know again point towards those people where, whenever I can and be a conduit towards. Uh, sharing stories and, and that goodness um, but also again I, trying to take care of myself involves also just you know nature is a, a huge uh, bomb for me and um, and just base you know taking time and prayer and poetry and music and these things to you know obviously uh, uh, and having community and those who are doing the work as well and, and it's very important but Thank you for asking that question. I don't think about it enough, to be honest. And um, Kelly, I think this will have to be our last question before we uh, conclude our discussion and, and turn things back to Sister Annie. Um, is there a story that you could share with us about how your work came to be featured on the cover of Pope Francis's book? And, and what does this mean to you? Mm. Well, it really comes from a relationship with Robert Ellsberg and um, we had never met. and. He, he had seen it online and it was during this time of uh it was shared broadly online and, and during the 2016 uh time and um again with all this rhetoric and he didn't know who painted it and he searched for a long time it was shared and he couldn't find who had painted it and he just stumbled uh, upon my uh, website and, and gave me a call and uh and it was kind of sparked up a really uh, interesting friendship now because of that. Um, but it's really, you know, his work seeing that and, and standing by the image as something that would be, could really, you know, potentially be provocative, but that we could, we're really getting at the heart of Pope Francis's writings on um, migrants and refugees. And uh, again, could be something that, um, for some people being a Pope's book could be shocking, um, but potentially that would create dialogue. And so I, I'm really grateful for, for those who uh, people like Robert and others who share my work 
but then also are, you know, wanting to take part in, again, in these, I've said it many times already, but these hard conversations that we really need to be having in the church. And so, again, I'm just honored that the image could be used in, in, in for those writings by Pope Francis, but also that uh, just more evidence that these, these conversations are indeed happening. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for joining us uh, here thank today, uh, for sharing your your heartfelt and hand wrought uh, artwork uh, for its its origins, its inspirations, uh, the way in which uh, traditions medieval uh, and contemporary have have influenced your work, and 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 the reasons why that you you are um, uh, doing what you're doing, and uh, about the the conversations and the influence that you hope uh, this artwork can uh, have uh, today. Um, uh, thank you very much for being with us and uh, an early happy birthday to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, and I want to add my thanks to both Kelly and Richard for the conversation today and glad we got to look at your beautiful images. Uh, really uh, good for for praying, praying with these icons, Visio Divina. So we are at the end of our time, and I want to thank again Richard and Kelly for uh, leading us through this conversation. And I also want to acknowledge the sponsors for today's event, the Program of Liberal Studies at the University of Notre Dame and the Institute for Scholarship in the Liberal Arts College of Arts and Letters. We hope that you'll be back for the fourth and final webinar in our series. Uh, we will be joined by author Christina Cleveland, and the topic will be the Black Madonna for Racial Liberation. So uh, hearing about a pilgrimage to see Black Madonnas in France. That's on March 24th at 12 p.m. And you can learn more about the series and find video recordings of this conversation and our previous webinars at medieval.nd.edu slash pilgrimage. So we hope you will be back and uh, look at what we've uh, been doing up till now. And thanks again to Kelly and Richard and have a wonderful afternoon.